our speaker is Dan Kowalskop, and Dan uh, is no stranger to, to this space. He was a uh, postdoc here at, at Cornell, uh, like from math department, uh, right after he received his degree in 1994, 1990. And uh, he was working on, on four to one resonance uh, and the uh, sort of dynamics that, that are associated with it in the problem that has been popularized by Arnold. And one of the things that we did was to use the computer facilities in, in CAM in order to draw some really lovely pictures of the bifurcation sets and the, the, this problem with this three natural parameters and, and so you get bifurcation surfaces. So uh, since then he has been a number of places. Uh, for the last eight years he has been a uh, professor in the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, before that he was at uh, Bristol University in England for a number of years. Um, he's going to tell us today about work that is somewhat associated with this John Wall Center that is a very large collaboration dealing with uh, uh, lasers and uh, other quantum sorts of technologies. It's great to have you back again. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks for everybody. Yes, it's uh, great to see that the couches that are out there are the original couches. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, sit, you know, they sit amazingly well. You sit down, you would think they're new, but unfortunately the covers are more spoiled than they were in 20 years ago. I would certainly hope that they'll still be there for a long, long time to come. Maybe collective effort, you know, we could reserve a bit. Anyway, uh, this is about excitability and feedback to Pulse or not to Pulse. This is work with Swazik Teria and Neil Broderick, who are both, uh, Swazik is a postdoc, and with Neil Broderick and myself, uh, Neil is from the physics department, and we're all part of this called World Center for Photonic and Quantum Technologies, and our collaborators in France, at the center, they have the, the Nanote Nanotechnology Center in Paris, are Sylvain Barbet, and his postdoc under a pump. So, uh, excitability and feedback. So, this is about a particular realization of laser systems, but I try to make this talk as general as possible because the, really the phenomena I'll be talking about require you to have something that's excitable and you have some sort of feedback. Okay? So, first of all, why are we interested in lasers and so forth? Um, you may all have a laser in your possession your laptop storage device. You make phone calls. All of this is done optically these days. Uh, entertainment uses laser. Believe it or not, you can buy a lawnmower that uses a laser to cut the grass. So lasers are truly absolutely everywhere these days. But uh, of most technological need for telecommunication is that you have regular pulses of light that you produce at high repetition frequency. And then information is basically encoded by sort of blocking out a pulse or not. And that's a zero or one. Okay. And of course, you want to do this very reliably. You want to transmit this information over fiber cables over long distances. So you have to have very accurate, small, cheap sources that produce this kind of stuff for all the different kinds of elements. So really, uh, an important question is how to produce these reliable pulse strains of laser pulses. And I would be lying to, if I would say this problem hasn't already been solved. Obviously, there are all kinds of devices that do it. But you want to always be faster, shorter pulses, smaller devices, integration on chip, and so forth. So it's really not a problem that's coming with Okay? And of course, you always have a little bit of noise. Lasers are actually not very noisy, but you know, they're quantum systems, so there is some noise in them. And your respect over the noise level, you want to be as accurate as possible. So really what counts is the repetition time, okay? Because if you're very fast and your pulse comes a bit early or a bit later, you may misinterpret it as a bit not being there. <coughs> so here is... Um, the result of a simulation of the system I'll show you in a moment. You can see some pulses. Uh, this is what comes out of the system when it sub-pulses. 
And you can say, well, this is not too bad, you know, it's a pulse strain, you can keep this going forever and ever and ever. Uh, there's a little bit of noise on there, which you can see, you have, you have a few little blips, right? So this is just a, a simple dynamical system that itself pulses, and you have a bit of noise on it. And you'll see that the noise influences the amplitude of the pulses. So they're not all the same height, but really that's not such a big problem, because as long as they're all about some reasonable threshold, you don't really care about that system. But if you look at the picture more carefully, you will notice that some distance between pulses are definitely longer than others. And so there is really some variation in the interpulse frequency. And that's also referred to as jitter, and that's really what you don't want. Okay? Because when you read out, you, you have a clock, and you say, OK, now the pulse is coming or it's not coming. And uh, you, you, you want to be sure it's a deterministic thing, and you're not just missing a pulse because it came a bit earlier or a bit later. Okay? So the question is really how, if you have a system that produces these pulses, how can you make the pulsing more stable and uh, more regular? By stable, I mean more regular. Okay. In this pulse time, the time between two pulses should basically be exactly the same, up to a very small error of margin. Okay, even in the presence of noise in the system. Everybody with me? Okay. So one idea is that you employ an excitable laser. So instead of having a laser that already pulses regularly, but gives you not quite such a clean signal, you now have a laser that's excitable, so it's not pulsing at all. But if you hit it with a little pulse, okay, then it will react by sending out a pulse. Sort of like what neurons do, right? So you have neurons, they're excitable, another neuron sends something in, and then they react and they send out a spike themselves. And if you couple this to itself with some delay loop, you can imagine that the pulse comes out and the laser you know, recharges or your neuron recharges, and just after some fixed time, the pulse comes back and it triggers the next pulse. So you have control over the interpulse spike interval by just the length of this delay loop, and of course there's an element of the system reacting to your pulse. Okay? So that's the idea, and I have a nice illustration for how this works in practice. So what's an excitable system? Basically an excitable system is just a reservoir of energy it slowly fills up in what's called the refractory period, uh, during which time your system basically doesn't react to an input. Okay? But when it's full, if you have a small perturbation, nothing happens. The system is at equilibrium. But a sufficiently small, uh, large but still small perturbation triggers a large reaction. Okay? Namely, a, a, a discharge of the energy from the reservoir. Okay, so this is like a flush. Okay? This is small perturbation. It's large enough, the thing is full. You get a large reaction. Out. And of course, if it's not full, nothing happens either. Okay, so this is this is very important for for these systems. So you have this reservoir. It flushes out completely. The reaction is almost independently of the input, provided it's large enough, because it just depends on how much energy is in your reservoir. <coughs> okay, and but once you flushed it, you basically have to wait for a while until it recharges. Okay, and um, so these are basically the standard properties of excitable systems that you can find in all kinds of papers and books illustrated here like this. And neurons, lasers, electronic circuits, you may have other examples of where this kind of thing occurs. And the idea is now that you put in a feedback loop, okay? So I don't know how many plumbers are in the room, but as a challenge, okay, just get a little bit of water off here let it run, I don't know, through your living room and so forth, and come back somehow, and then trigger the next reaction, okay? And make sure this is long enough so that your reservoir fills in the meantime, okay? So you can imagine, you can literally plumb your own excitable system in your bathroom. Um, not sure if you should really recommend it. Um, any uh, legal consequences, don't blame me for it, okay? So if you... <clears throat> but you get the idea, okay? So you get, if you have something excitable, you trigger it once, you can get it to self-trigger after a certain time, which has to be larger than the time you need for the reservoir. Okay? Now, uh, yes? Can you explain? Uh, oh, I, I, I don't think I quite follow the self-trigger mechanism. What is the output? Uh, what is the input? Okay, this is very systematic. I'll show it to you how it really works for a laser. Okay. You would have to bleed off some water. That's the idea. Or you know have some mechanism that detects so the that water flushes. So that's the sensor of the state. Okay. It could be a sensor. Yes. So the idea is that when it flushes, okay, you somehow record it, and after a while you do the next trigger. Where the time when you trigger the next one is fixed. 
if you were to really do this with water, you would have to have some water works and it runs around and uh, you know, then I, I know, it would be a bit complicated. But the point is the feedback measures the state of the reservoir. Yes. yes. So it does basically there's no input and as soon as it flushes, it, it, you know, it, that, that's what the, what the signal starts. Now let me actually explain this for lasers because then it's actually much more intuitive. Okay, so first of all, we need of course an excitable system. Okay? So you have to come up with a laser that's excitable. And uh, the way to do this is that you put a so-called absorber. So I don't know how many people know their basic laser 101. So in 30 seconds, the laser is just a so-called gain medium between two mirrors. Okay, so there's, there's a standing wave here. So basically photons zip back and forth. They get amplified in this medium. And if uh, and this is laser stands for um, spontaneous light amplification by so a stimulated emission, right? It's a stimulated emission, right? So photons come by, the next photons jump on, you get coherent light in this cavity, and it's large enough, some light couples out, okay? That's the laser. And now you put this absorber in here, okay? And um, this absorber is like your reservoir, okay? It starts absorbing all these excited states, or the photons, if you like, and only when the absorber is full, that changes the refractive index, and then the light, and then the laser can really start lasering, okay? So think of this as the reservoir that's being filled. This is electrically pumped for a semiconductor laser. So here you put the energy in, and it takes a long time on the scales of lasers for this to then be sort of charged. But then if it is, it can send out a pulse if you trigger it, okay? And you can have it in different configurations. And the nice thing is under certain mild conditions or assumptions, it's described by this three-dimensional ODE. This is an equation for the gain, equation for the absorption, and this is the intensity of the laser light, okay? So it's a very simple ODE. I will not go into details, but you can imagine that you're sort of charging this up and you, something leaks out, and this is the production of the light. We can go into these details. For people who have seen laser equations before, this is not very surprising. Maybe the only surprising thing is I'm not writing down a complex E field because the phase is not important. I'm writing down just an equation for the intensity of the light, okay? So anyway, you have a three-dimensional ODE, and that's a classical, you know, classical problem in dynamical systems. Find the bifurcations, you know, what's the possible behavior, and so forth and so forth. And so the equations comes from there. And that's actually something I did right after my first job here in Cornell. I went to, uh, to the Free University of Amsterdam and worked in the theoretical physics department, and this was one of the first problems we worked there. This is continued with, uh, out of this is the bifurcation diagram. I will not go over all the details. They are in this paper if you want to have a look. The idea is this is this parameter gamma, which is small. Okay? So really you want to think you just cut across here. That's all you do. One, the laser's off. This is this is I, so this is the invariant line I is zero, so that no I, no intensity laser's off, okay? It's global uh, equilibrium, global attractor. Then you go into number two, you have a settlement bifurcation, you create a saddle and a repeller, okay? And it's still off, okay? This is still the only attractor. But now you notice if I jump sort of in this two-dimensional representation, the jump over here, and instead of going straight down, I make this large excursion, okay? That's an example of an excitable system, and this is close to homoclinic bifurcation, which creates a periodic orbit once you cross through here which is now a self pulsation. In fact, the first picture I showed you is for this self pulsation with a little bit of noise. Okay. So the laser can self pulsate on its own, but before it does that, it's actually excitable, where you will notice that basically the shape of these things is sort of the same. Okay, so the pulse you get when it is excitable is pretty much the same pulse you would get when it self pulsating. It's just a matter of how much energy you put in, right? So it's not enough energy for the thing to kick off the pulse on its own, but it's sort of charged, so if you give it a little kick, kick then it does it. That's illustrated here by these pictures. These are actually what this really looks like in the projection of the G and I in this, in this body. Okay, so now, the idea is now, you see now it's a much easier plumbing problem. So all you do is you take the light that comes out and you send it through a fiber or space of sufficient distance. The laser is very small, a millimeter, so if you have a mirror at a distance of 30 centimeters, that's already a long delay loop, okay? 
and you have uh, an attenuator that's basically something where you can adjust the intensity of the light right, that comes back, and you just feed some of the light that comes back through. And this is a beam splitter, so most of the light goes through, but you bleed off something. Okay, this is like exactly the solution of the plumbing problem. It's actually easier to do it for a laser than it would be with a buffer. Okay? This is just an isolator because you don't want some parasitic effects. Okay? So it's really very simple. Okay, you have a laser, and you, you, the light comes out, you feed some light back, and of course you also have to have a way to kick this off in the first place, but I've not drawn this in this picture. Okay, so that's the idea. And now, of course, we have the feedback strength, which is determined by this, and the delay time, which is the length of this loop, as additional control parameters. And the idea would be that you can make very stable pulses sort of at the length of tau, right? The naive idea is tau determines the repetition time, the system always reacts sort of equally fast, faster than the delay, and then a very nice regular pulse, okay? And of course, you can imagine that the feedback strength has to have a certain level, otherwise nothing happens, right? Because without feedback, nothing happens. Okay? Everybody with me? Yes. yes. Okay. Maybe, maybe Alex. Alex first. Yeah. What's, what's the steel of the recharge time? Okay, from I'll come to back to this in a moment because I have some experimental results with a few minutes left. Okay? Yeah. The recharge times, this is all very fast. I mean, the laser pulses are a few picoseconds and the repetition time, I mean, everything's extremely fast. Okay? So tau is much larger. Tau is much larger. Tau is 30 seconds, right? And speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. Sorry, 30 centimeters, back and forth, 60 centimeters. You work out what the times are. It's Nanos extremely short, Nanosecond. but it's multiples of the internal time scales of the laser, which are even short, and also yeah. work on the speed of light, okay? This is a nanosecond. Okay. Now, the nice thing is that, um, I worked out, uh, I was start becoming interested in this feedback problem more from a more theoretical point of view with a master student of mine while I was still in Bristol. And at a conference I met Sylvain Barbet, who has built this device, okay? This is the picture, it also shows you. This is five micrometers, okay? This is very, very tiny, but it basically looks like a coffee cup. The laser, the light comes out at the top. All of the stuff around is basically insulation. So think of this glass, okay? The light comes out at the top. Okay, and it has layers, this is the schematic. It has two layers of gain and one layer of absorption, all in this tiny structure. Okay, so it's a laser with the satchel absorber in there, schematically as what I showed you before, but all in this tiny device, which is an enormous feat of engineering. They grow these devices and it took them years and years to get this to work. Okay? And uh, when I talk about layers, it's basically atomic layers of material, okay? I mean, it's really absolute tiny stuff. Okay? Most of the stuff you hear, see here are mirror sets because you have to get the reflected. So they have this device, and they were characterizing it, and they went to our paper, and they had <coughs> printouts of the paper in the lab because they wanted to know where in the, bi where, where in the bifurcation diagram they were with their laser. So that's really pretty cool. And uh, that's what they did. So they characterized the device without feedback first, also in the presence of noise, and they showed that it really agrees very well with these Yamada equations that I've just shown you a moment ago. So this laser is an excitable laser. It can also produce self pulsations depending on the energy of it. Okay. So now the experiment that we're really interested in is, is doing this. So you take this laser and you put this feedback. Okay, so I'll show you the first results of the experiment. Um, yeah, they're units here, Alex, but it doesn't really say what they are, okay? This is probably gigahertz or something. Okay, so it's very, very fast. Uh, in the papers, it doesn't really, you know, doesn't really say what, what they are. So what, here's the easy result. So this is the real experimental setup, okay? What you need is you actually pump this thing. You put some light of a certain frequency in, then this excites the gain, and then some the laser is actually at a different frequency. You can see some is going through this beam splitter. Here's the detector of what comes out. This is my feedback loop, and that goes back into here. Okay, everybody with me? It's basically a different picture. Yes? So at the mirror, they split the feedback? Sorry? At the mirror? This mirror, at the mirror, yeah, it's called Fabri. <coughs> oh, it's it's just a type of mirror. Is that the feedback? It is. The, this is the feedback. Okay. And this is the measurement. So in my picture, it was 
and I'll add a feedback loop with a sort of a fiber, but this is just in free air, okay? You have this in the lab. You can't see the laser, by the way, because it's tiny. Okay, the light comes out, it goes and goes back. It's, you know, conception simple, but you have a lot of measurement. Okay? So now if you don't have feedback, and you give this a kick, okay, then nothing happens. That's a red signal, okay? When you kick it, and then, yeah, you get one thing out, but that's it. It's not self-sustained. And if you have feedback, then you can see you get regular pulse, pulsing. That's the black stuff, okay? At a reasonably well-controlled amplitude, and the repetition rate is also quite good. And I should tell you that this is not one experiment. This is actually 50 experiments overlaid, okay? So that shows that the time in jitter from experiment to experiment is not very large. Okay, so if I show you just one experiment, you would just see one peak, but this is actually several. So there's some spread in amplitude and there's some jitter, but it's not very large. So it, it just shows that the naive idea, if you do it right in a certain parameter region, yes, you can hit it once and it produces a pulse time. So are you on your limit cycle? No, I'm before the limit cycle is there. So it's so in its excitable it, region. What is producing the, the pulses? Exactly this. So you have a reservoir, the laser, you, you pump energy into the laser, and it loads up, okay, like a flash, you know, like a you know, like your flash, you know, it takes a while and then it's loaded, and then you trigger it and it releases the energy. But, but your equations are describing what happens in this microcolor. Yes. As I say. Yes. And all of this stuff on top is the feedback. It's the feedback. I will come to the feedback in just a moment. Okay, so the equations I showed you before, they're not capable of doing this. I will come to the explanation of this in more detail in a moment. So now, here's the interesting thing. Um, people in this field like to represent this like it were some sort of PDE problem, okay? So here is the delay time, okay? And then we're stacking up round trips, okay? So instead of having a time series that just keeps going and going, I chop it up in blocks of tall, which is my external round trip time, and I put them on top of each other. Everybody with me? And so if I trigger something here, this is experimental data, you see I have a slanted line, that's a bit of jiggle jaggle here, and that's one pulse train. And you'd also see it takes a little bit more than the delay time for the next thing to trigger because the system after the delay has to react to the input, okay? Everybody with me? No. No, <laughs> okay, I should certainly explain it so everybody understands it. So I have a time series, I take the time series from before, Right, this is my time series, and it, it, the pulse is approximately every tall, but the time in between pulses is a bit longer than tall because the system has to react to the input. Have you explained why there is a pulse? I believe I have. Have I? I wonder if you go back to the picture that has like the periodic orbit, but then pre-periodic sure, orbit. Sure, I can show that. Like, like, okay, so here's the picture. I'm in this regime. Okay. If I trigger this about here. It goes around, it takes a long time to creep back, and when you're back to this point, you can trigger it again. Oh, you're, you're running the trigger several yes. times. No, I have a feedback loop. Right. So okay. some of the light comes back into the laser and triggers it again. Okay. It's, it's like I would try to indicate... Why doesn't, that, why doesn't that correspond to situation 7? Uh, it does and it doesn't, but let me get back to this later, because this is only the equation for the laser on its own without the feedback loop yet. And I will explain the equations with the feedback loop in three slides. Okay, so this is the experimental result. So what you now do is you take this black time series and you chop it up in bits of tall, okay, and you stack them round trip over round trip, which is a bit like what you would do in a PDE, right? Because you have space, time, this is the motivation. So if I trigger something here, see this is where the trigger was, the pulse keeps going, okay? That corresponds to the experiment before. Now, the interesting thing is this. The delay time is relatively long. Much longer than the laser needs to recover its energy. Okay, so if you have, if you trigger a laser like here, if you trigger a pulse train like here, okay, this is uh, on the cylinder, okay, then you can trigger a second one somewhere else because the laser has already recovered. So this is rather nice. So if the delay line is long enough, and your laser has recovered, then you can trigger another pulse, seemingly anywhere in between here. And as you can see, it also survives. And you now you have two pulse trains in there. 
And you can imagine you can try to do this more. And the question is, you know, how does this work? When can you do it? What are the limits of this? Because you can see this is like a memory device now. Okay, so the information in the pulses is regenerated by the feedback ad infinitum, seemingly at least in these pictures. Okay, and you can write another bit somewhere else, maybe somewhere else. And the idea is, because it's tiny devices, is optical storage of information by regenerating it in this periodic fashion by this feedback. Okay? Now, of course, the question is, can you always do this? Okay? Or is there more stuff going on? When does it work? When does it not work? So now let me come to the delay equations, which is actually now what explains this. Okay? So the bit that was missing was the delay loop. Okay? Before, I only talked about the individual device. Now I put the delay in. In this particular case, you have a delay in just the intensity. The light comes out as intensity, it goes back in as intensity. So the equation is really very simple. You just put a certain percentage kappa of the output light back into the laser after delay tall. Okay? So this is the equation now we work on quite extensively. So after this sort of long introduction, now we want to study this equation which is now a delay equation. Okay? So it formalizes this naive idea in this equation. And the question is now, depending on parameters, kappa, tau, a, a, b, and so forth, does the scheme work or does it not work? Okay? What are the issues? Where is the energy coming from? Energy comes from this pumping term. This is the, so you put more a in, you, you move from excitability to self -possible. That was part of the. That was one of the parameters on the bifurcation diagram, on the horizontal axis. Okay. Now, the issue is we move from an ODE to delay equation. Okay. You would say, oh, big deal. You know, it's just we're just talking about simple self-sustaining of pulsations. But really, a delay equation with a single delay, generally written in this form, you have a derivative which depends on the present state, but it also depends on the delay state. You can write this down in even more complicated forms, but this is the simplest way, and this is actually what this equation looks like. You take an ODE and just put a delay term on, which depends just on a single fixed delay, okay? Now the issue is that in order to prescribe the future for a delay equation, it's no longer enough to prescribe an initial condition, okay, of GQI. You have to describe a whole history interval back to time minus tall. Okay, so imagine I prescribe this history, okay, of length tall, then I have an actual flow of this semi-group that's generated by this delay equation, which you can imagine as a roller coaster car, okay, moving over the roller coaster. Okay, the state that you're talking about at any time is always of length tall. It's a function segment of length tall over the interval say from minus tau to zero, or from zero to tau as you like, with values in x, which in my case is g, q, and i. Okay? So, it's a completely different kettle of fish, and it's somewhere in between ODEs and PDEs. So here are some basic properties of delay equations. The evolution operator describes the forward evolution for all time. If you start with continuous initial conditions, the phase space is the infinite dimensional space of function segments and the space of continuous functions over x. Okay, so it's an infinite dimensional system. Uh, it can be computed numerically by integration. You have to be a bit careful. Don't just take your standard integrator. Take one that's designed for, uh, for delay equations. Okay? And of course, the question is, what can you do beyond numerical simulation? And the good news is we can do a lot. First of all, if you have fixed delays, the linearization of an equilibrium and a periodic orbit is discrete. <laughs> okay, you have at most finitely many unstable directions, all uh, and infinitely many stable directions which accumulate at, at minus infinity and around the origin, respectively. Okay? So <laughs> this means that uh, only discrete eigenvalues can cross the imaginary axis as you change parameters. Which means that you get all the bifurcations you also see for ODEs, okay? Sort of one after the other. Settle mode, half, 
and so forth. Okay? So you get the whole bifurcation theory that you know for ODEs can happen there as well. So think of this somehow as an infradimensional system which always has a finite dimensional core. You just don't know how big the finite dimensional core is as a function of the parameters a priori. Okay? And you can also have homoclinic and heteroclinic bifurcation. So in a way, this is great. I call <coughs> delay equations with fixed delays ODE plus plus. Okay? It's an infinite dimensional system in which you see exactly the bifurcations that you find in ODEs. All right? Well, that's nice. Of course, this is only good if you also have the tools to work this out. And in numerical bifurcation analysis, I don't know who's heard here of Alto and other packages like this for the continuation or bifurcation analysis, XPP, XPP out, right? Basically, you have versions of this for delay. You can imagine they're more complicated. You have to do finite dimensional approximations, heuristics, blah, blah, blah. But you can do bifurcation theory and bifurcation analysis detect and follow local co-dimension 1 bifurcations. You can even follow some homoclinic orbits, sorry, detect homoclinic bifurcations. You can compute some invariant manifolds. So the tools are almost as good as for ODEs. It's just more work to work with it. It's of course slower because you're dealing with a discretization of an infinite dimensional space. There's a survey paper here for anyone who's interested. You can ask me later on. So the good news is if you're ever faced with the delay equation and, you know, sort of look back, wow, okay, now here's the delay, what did I do? Okay, at, at least if it's fixed delays, pretty much all the tools are there. You don't have to give up or throw in the towel. Just have to read up and the software is of course freely available. This, most of the stuff runs on a map. Okay, now what we want to do is we want a bifurcation analysis of the Amada delay equation, okay? So I do the same thing, I did this without this, and actually here I can give you a complete picture of all the bifurcations that happen. Now put the delay term on, and I want to do another bifurcation analysis because, indeed, if you have the delay included now, then my solution should be a periodic orbit now of the delay equation. Okay? So it's not a periodic orbit without the feedback, because as soon as I put the feedback on and the thing repeats periodically, it's now a periodic orbit of the delay equation. Okay? So we choose some reason, some region in parameter space, which is, uh, you know, our experimental colleagues tell us this is where to look, these are good parameter values, and so on and so on. And really what we're interested in is the tall kappa plane, because remember these are our new control parameters. One is the delay of the feedback and the other one is just the strength. So if tau is zero or kappa is zero, you're actually back to the ODE. Okay, so you can imagine perturbing away from the ODE case, at least for small tau, and it's actually a regular perturbation. But that's uh, maybe for the specialists. So, find all the bifurcations and all the possible behavior. This is the picture I showed you before of the, the equation without. This was basically it, okay? We can, in one paper, you can describe everything that can possibly go on in this system. And now let's have a look what happens if you switch the feedback on. Okay, this is, this is just uh, one bifurcation diagram in kappa and tau. This is tau, that's a delay. This is kappa, the feedback strength. And you can already see it's a little bit more complicated than we have for just the ODE, okay? So the ODE case happens when tau is zero, okay? All these bifurcations sort of disappear, and you get back to what you know is actually there. This is for the excitable case. You get half bifurcations, transcritical, homoclinic, saddle node of periodic orbits, tori, zero and half, blah, 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 blah. So the way to think about this is if you're colorblind and you can only see blue, I don't know who is blue qualifies, but if you can see blue, and you forget about the other colors, you see one curve of Hopf's bifurcation, okay? It goes up, starts out with a second, and then it looks like you take a crayon and you keep doing this, okay? <laughs> and that's really what it is. And on the curves of Hopf's bifurcation, you notice fatter parts of curves, bold face, and non bold face curves, they are in between certain co dimension two points. I'm not going to go into the detail here. But every time you cross from the left to the right, you are creating a stable periodic orbit. And the first one is the one that just supports one pulse. The second one supports the second pulse. I'll show you in a moment. And you can see if you keep going, there's considerable amount of stability. I can have quite a few stable orbits happening simultaneously. Now this is the saddle node of limit cycle. So if you cross here, at some moment also some periodic orbit is disappearing. Okay, so this is a bit complicated. The Hopf bifurcation curves, they cross at Hopf-Hopf points, 
at each of these hotspot points, you have two independent frequencies, effectively, and this can be, give you invariant tori and all kinds of stuff. Okay? You see that as a function of the delay, this gets very complicated very quickly. This is up to delay 200, which on the level of the experiment is still very small. Okay, they're more at 1,200, 2,000. It's a bit of a challenge. Okay, that's just to give you an impression. I could give a whole talk about this whole bifurcation diagram, but let me just show you your zoom here. If you go from here to here to here to here and so on, okay, just a zoom of the previous picture. Now let's have a look at what these solutions look like. Okay, in region 14, you now get lots of periodic orbits. Okay, a big one, a smaller one. Blue is stable, red is unstable. Um, it's not planar, okay? This is an infinite dimensional phase space. It's just a two dimensional projection. And you can see then you go to 15 and you create another one. I don't know. It's hard to see what's happening, but here you see two come close together and then they disappear, okay? You see you have more periodic orbits here than you have over here. Right? So they get born in hot bifurcations, okay? Here's another one born, right? So from the inside you make more and more and more, and sometimes you lose some on the outside. Okay? As you Cut across, you keep kappa fixed, and you increase the delay. Yes? I'm confused about something very basic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how does the number of the stable periodic orbits you are showing, how is it related to the number of pulses you can support? Next slide. <laughs> no, but what's the Seriously, period? here it is. Okay. <laughs> this is now the bifurcation, one parameter bifurcation diagram, just in tall, where I plot the period of the periodic orbit. Okay, and they give you branches like this, stable, unstable, close to each other. You see red and blue. Okay, they are basically linear and tall, tall, half tall, third tall. If you look what they do, okay, we, let's take a fixed value of 100. We have B. There's a stable one and an unstable one. Okay, this is exactly one pulse per round trip. Okay, so tall is 100. Hang on, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this wrong. This is one. One pulse per round trip is this one, but it doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Now this one has two pulses per round trip because this is 200, we're at 100, okay? Right? You see, you have exactly two pulses per round trip. Now you go to the next guy, you see you have exactly three per round trip. Okay? A stable one and an unstable one. And then here you have four per round trip. Stable one, unstable one. You can see this one's quite close to hot bifurcation. It's not so spiky, okay? Because near hot bifurcation, everything has to become very sinusoidal. Yes? So are you saying there's, there can be multiple relationships between the, how long the delay is and how many pulses are supposed What I'm saying is if you give me a, a, a pulse length, a external feedback length, let's say of 100, I can fit in two, three, or four pulses per round trip. But not more, not, not one in this particular case, and not five or six or seven, okay? So there's a limit. And the way to think about it is, how many you can put in maximally has to do with how quickly the reservoir recovers, right? If you put the next pulse in before it recovers, then it basically doesn't trigger the next pulse. But now these are, you know, we're not doing an experiment like this. We're now analyzing, do a bifurcation analysis of the delay equation, and I'm just telling you what periodic orbits you have. And I'm also telling you that these guys are stable. You said that you no longer can support just one pulse? Yes. So this is stable. This is, I, I, again, I'll get, this is actually part of the story. Okay, you know, let me go on. That's good. Everybody's thinking along the right lines here. But what I would, before I do this, let me just point out that of course you can have tori. You know, here's an example of an invariant torus in some projection at GHHQ. You know, it looks like this. It has a spectrum. You can have chaotic dynamics. You know, as soon as you have a delay equation, you have an infinite dimensional phase space, in particular, it's larger than three, all hell can break loose, okay? So the naive idea that this thing does nothing else but, you know, repeat nicely these pulses is actually very naive to begin with, okay? So if you come from delay equations, the first thought is, wow, this is a delay equation now. Thus, can that actually possibly work in the first place? Okay? So I will not discuss these more complicated solutions. It's also an exciting story to see all the other stuff that's in there. <laughs> Let me... Go to this picture, okay? Here is the projection of the GI. This is the off state, which in this case is also stable. Okay, so the laser can be off. It can pulse at this amplitude, so maximum amplitude, this maximum amplitude, this maximum amplitude, okay? So I have three different attractors plus this one, four attractors. And if the laser is off, I'm sitting here, 
And I can ask myself, if I now put a little perturbation in, which I can perturb in I or in G, okay, what do I see? So if you do this, you see that you get a very complicated uh, intermingling of the basins of these three periodic orbits. Okay, you get this candle structure where every boundary is basically the boundary of at least two other periodic orbits. Maybe people have heard of mingled basins before. Okay, so the colors correspond to these orbits here. Okay, here are intersections, so you can see that. Pretty hard to see the orange bit here because it gets a bit small. Okay, and, it, and, and down here is the basin of the off solution, which is the blue one, because if I have a small perturbation, nothing happens because it's stable itself. But basically, if I jump over the threshold now, it's no longer excitable. There are all these periodic solutions there. The question is, if I give the laser a kick, at which, you know, at which of these oscillations will it oscillate? Do you think that you're going to settle down to any of them? That's what I'm saying. There no other there are no other ones, no. No other generic no. behaviors? Not for this problem. Yet. How do you know that? Well, it's, it's a miracle word, word. It's, it's an infinite word, dimensional right? space. That's right. But it's, at every moment, it's, it's a finite dimensional thing because of these eigenvalue conditions. So yeah, it's not the mathematical proof that there's nothing else out there. That's true. But all numerical evidence suggests that this is what it is, OK? Oh, it's, it's numerical evidence. Of course. You don't actually have a proof. No, I, I know. I'm never finding a proof. In this kind of business, it's quite hard to prove anything, especially in delay equations. Okay? There are papers that prove very tiny little results of delay equations that are about 80 pages long and very technical. Okay? They are fantastic papers, but if you want to apply, you know, answer specific questions of, in an application, trying to prove something is not a first order call. Now, let me go to the experimental situation that our experimentalists are interested in, okay? So when we now don't want the off state to be stable as well, okay? They want to be able to write bits, okay, sort of almost at will. So we now take a, we now take tau to be of a certain length in such a way that we have exactly six stable solutions. Before I had three, now I have six, okay? And also, the fundamental solution where I only have one peak per round trip time is also exists and is stable. Okay, so here, this is my delay interval. I either have one peak, two peaks, three, four, five, six. Okay, they're all stable. Uh, these are calculations that, yeah, they may not be approved, but if you want it, you could throw some interval arithmetic around it and turn it into proofs. They are so semi-rigorous calculations. Okay? This is not simulation. This is continuation. Right, now you notice, as you put more peaks in the cavity, their amplitudes go down. Which is sort of logical because, so, you know, there's less energy there, right? The amount of energy I put in in every single case is the same. Okay? And you can also imagine that at some moment you will not be able to get anything else because that's not enough energy or the pulse comes to that. Okay, now you look at the Floki multipliers. Okay? This is mu. So <coughs> all the k multipliers have to be less than one in modulus for these things to be stable. Now this one <coughs> is a single one. This is well below one. And the other ones are actually very close to zero. You can see this here, OK? See that? You can even say, is this below zero or not? I'm telling you it's below zero. You can check that by independent simulations, OK? But the punchline is that the more pulses you have in the cavity, the less stable the solution actually is. Okay. But it's stable. If you start close enough to it, you know, it will stay there. Okay. You can simulate this if you don't believe. Okay, so the first one is very stable, but the other ones are sort of less stable. Right? Now the question is, okay, so, the, so now the issue okay, so now the issue is we are claiming that this is the only these are the only attractors of the system. Yeah, no proof, but all the numerical evidence suggests for our equations is these are the only attractors, okay? So if I trigger pulses, and notice they are all equidistant, right? If I now trigger pulses willy-nilly, and then you don't start off with equidistant pulses, our result suggests that in the experiment, you should <laughs> see a slow drift towards equidistance where the speed of the drift is directly related to the Floquet multipliers that we're calculating here, right? Something's weakly attracting, it will take much longer to get there. Don't forget there's also noise in the system, 
Okay, so you basically have sort of a noise process where you're jumping around, but there's still some convergence to equidistance. That's the prediction from the theory. So it took them a long time to be able to do these experiments because you have to sustain the pulse strength for a very, very, very long time. You know, if you have a bit of noise, you could be unlucky and sort of the thing skips a beat, and as soon as you miss one regenerating pulse, the thing dies, right? Because then the feedback loop is broken. So here now, the, uh, here's our prediction. So this is, you start with two pulses, let's say at this distance, you see it's not equidistant. You wait for a very, very long time. This is in the beginning, this is at the end, and they become equidistant. When you plot the distance between them, you can see they go to both to sort of 50%, okay? That's the prediction. But it takes a long time, even already in the simulation, which is without noise. This is just a deterministic prediction. Okay, so the, we're saying in this parameter region, where they're looking, if you wait long enough, if you manage to get these pulses to survive long enough, they should become more equidistant. And here's the experimental result. <coughs> this is for two pulses. You see two pulses. This is the distance between two pulses, which is plotted here. You see there's quite some noise in the system, so it jiggles around. But quite convincingly, if you wait long enough, it basically jiggles around the 50% mark, symmetric. This is for three, you see more impressive. So the three pulses, you see the pulses are not kilometers apart. Okay, because you would have to wait even longer, even longer, even longer. But they're clearly not equidistant in the beginning, as you can see here, and they become sort of more equidistant. So think of this like an onstead gutenberg process. You know, you have noise that drives you away, and you have a small, uh, weak contraction that drives you towards some equilibrium, or in this case, vertical. Okay. So this is the experimental confirmation that even with noise, you see this drift towards equidistant pulse. And here it's now trying to write pulses when you already have pulses. Okay? I showed you just one picture where one pulse and we write another pulse. Okay, now let's do this more complicated. Yeah. One pulse and a second pulse. They have a certain distance. You try to write here, you try to write here, the pulse arrives for a little while, it gets too close to the other one. Okay, it's too close, the other one it sort of eats up its energy, there's not enough energy, the thing dies. This one it's even worse. It's too close to this one, and it sort of dies immediately, okay? Because the reservoir has not recouped sufficiently to sustain the pulse, okay? Here, this one is more centrally between these two, and you can see that survives. So you can see we can switch from two pulses to three pulses if we trigger the new pulse at the right time. Here's another example. Here, B looks pretty promising, so it survives for a really long time but at the last minute, it sort of breaks up. If you're very careful and have good eyes, you see there's some periodicity going on here, okay? So it sort of starts to flicker before it dies. It's like your candle, right? It starts flickering and then... Okay? But here we can, if we trigger this guy, survive. So again, this is going from two to three pulses in this device. Okay, so now, of course, the question is, uh, when can you switch and when can you not switch? So uh, the experiments are actually quite difficult. They, you know, the, the thing runs, and they cannot actually decide on the picosecond where to trigger the next pulse. So what they do is they sort of do it at semi-random. They put pulses in, and then you see where they came out, right? So there's lots and lots of experiments, and then you see what's happened. A lot of them don't work, some work. So it's actually not easy to make these experiments, OK? Um, to sustain the lasing, and so forth, and so forth. But also, you, you don't, it's not easy to really trigger exactly where you want to want. Okay, so the question is really, where does this work? Okay, so you have some pulses in your cavity, you want to maybe put another bit in there, how do I do that? You had a question? So, like, what's, what's the time scale of, like, the whole experiment? The delay time is, uh, let's say, 50 centimeters, okay, which you travel through at 300,000 kilometers per second. So it's on the order of... And the minus nine second. And this is very short, right? This is at the resolution minimum of our oscilloscopes. It's very fast. That's nice about lasers. You can produce enormous amounts of data in a second if you can get the thing to survive. You have another question. Is the motivation for being able to introduce new pulses 
methods introducing this as some sort of a memory device when you're writing? With That's exactly right. So you can, uh, I'm not showing this here, but there's also ways of erasing pulses. If you, if you trigger it at the right moment, you can wipe out the pulse. And, and the new pulse also doesn't survive. Okay. So that's really the idea. You have a number of bits in there, which get repeated and repeated and repeated, okay? And then you just want to write a new bit or you want to erase it. Now we're just talking about writing new bits. And as you can see, you have to be a bit careful about it because otherwise you lose the information. Did you have another question? Yeah. So in terms of what survives and what doesn't, you previously were talking about the strength for which they are attracting nearby solutions. Yes. But somehow, which survives seems to be a question of the size of the basin of attraction. Very More good. than the question of the Guess what? Here my base is on the I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> this was very well spent 20 hours to ask the elephant master my question. <laughs> okay, let's go exactly to this question, okay? So you remember we're we slowly drifting to equidistance. Okay? So if you really want to use this as a long-term storage device for information, you have to use the equidistant states. Because otherwise you're drifting off. Okay? The only you, you need to know when to expect the pulse and to see whether it's there or not. So timing is everything here. <coughs> so here's the first picture. If you have a single pulse, blue region is one, and you want to trigger the next pulse, you can maybe see in gray that there's a little spike here, that's when the pulse happens, we trigger this on the pulse. Then if you have enough delta G, which is the perturbation, perturbation is large enough, Okay, if it's not large enough, nothing happens. If it's sufficiently large, it also has to be well-timed in this interval, basically staying away from the pulse at both ends, which makes sort of sense, right? So you've just seen if it's too close. If it's too close afterwards, it dies. If it's too close before, it survives, but it kills the previous pulse. Yeah, and you sort of can't wait. However, in this region, which is about, I don't know, 80% of the time, if it's high enough, you, you actually trigger a second pulse. And you have to wait for quite some time before they become equidistant. Of course, if you trigger in the middle, it's already pretty much equidistant. But even if it's not in the middle, they drift towards equidistance, OK? Uh, how long is the spike time in terms of the device? Um, in, the, in this example with two, we had uh, 1,500 round trips, which is very long but for, for laser physics. It's only, I don't know, a few picoseconds. Mm -hmm. But you have to think in terms of the life, lifetimes of the laser. So these times are quite long. And they get longer here. If you do for three, it's probably two and a half thousand. So it was actually not easy for them to do the experiments because you have to sustain this thing reliably in the presence of noise or all kinds of stuff. Anyway, if you do this with two, okay, then you can jump from two to three. Here's the one pulse, here's the second. Again, if you're well in between and the perturbations is stronger. Okay? So now this is really a sort of a two-dimensional slice through the, through, the, through the basins of attraction, similar to this fractal picture I showed you earlier. Okay, and the boundaries here are formed by stable manifolds of co-dimension one periodic orbits in this infinite dimension, which we can't really compute, but at least you can do this one. Okay, so if you look at this boundary, you see, well, you can't really see it, but there's some extra structure. Okay? So this is really a particular slice through the basins of attraction, written out, as a function of the timing of this periodic solution. Okay, it's really timing is everything. Yes? Aren't there really three bases of attraction in the top left because you have a zero somewhere? No, but the, okay, I should have mentioned the off state is no longer stable for these experiments. Oh. Okay. So we, I showed you, you can have the laser in the off state and yeah. then kick it and see how it pulses. But this is now a different parameter regime where I just have six periodic solutions and the off state is no longer stable. So if you switch the laser on, it will laze at one of these six attractors, eventually. So in the case, it's, all, it's well on the right of the top left diagram, then it would just merge with the pulse. There's, there would just be one. Yeah, if you're here, if you trigger a pulse, that pulse will survive, but then the next pulse that wants to come doesn't get sustained. You know, it's like you're flushing the toilet too early, so when you really want to flush it, there's no water in it. Okay. On the other hand, the other cases, you just flushed and there's no water, so the next right. flush will not do it. So it's a combination of the two depending on the timing. Right. So you, this is not, you know, you can't really see this in this picture, but that's just a long-term behavior. Now, guess what? You start with three, you can get to four, but notice now that these regions become really considerably smaller, okay? And now comes the surprise. If you have four, you cannot go to five at all. And in fact, the only thing you can do is you can go down to three, but you have to time it really well. 
So three, in some sense, is extremely stable. Okay, you can almost perturb it any way, which way you like. If you trigger a pulse, then it wipes out another pulse, or it doesn't survive. It's very hard if you're free in this particular configuration to. You can't trigger a fifth one. Okay, and even going down to three is not easy. You have to time it exactly right. Now, if you have five, you can only go down to four. Okay, I'm talking always starting from the equidistant. Okay. That's the idea. And then from six, you can go down to five. So from six, it's relatively easy to go down to five. From five, it's relatively easy to go down to three. But basically, what this means is that even though you can sustain up to six periodic solutions stably in this cavity, you cannot get there. If you want to use this as a memory, that uses equidistance, which is what you should be doing, because that's a long-term trend. So in some sense, you can only use half of the cavity length if you want to write something. Because the distance between pulses has to be long enough for the thing to trigger. They can create five pulses or six pulses, but then you have to trigger them basically one after the other. Okay? You cannot wait until they become equidistant. You can imagine, right? You, you give six quick pulses in succession in one round trip, and then they can be sustained. It's not contradicting the fact that these solutions are there and are stable. It's just saying if you want to use it as a memory and you have three pulses, you cannot possibly go. <coughs> Uh, you can go to four, but you cannot possibly go back uh, higher on. Okay? So in some sense, the cavity that you have, you can use roughly only half of what you have. Now, these are um, numerical results of the equations, and they have not yet been able to do these experiments because it's exactly very hard to time the stuff, this cavity. Okay? So they would have to make lots and lots of experiments, so the data this is sort of in hand. So with this, let me conclude. So multi-stable equidistant pulsing solutions exist. And if you have an excitable system with delayed feedback, that's effectively the ingredients you need. Okay? So a lot of the stuff I've been talking about, you can step back and say, OK, take a different excitable system with a feedback loop you know, with the right time scales. It's laser, it's very fast. It's electronics, it's 1,000 times slower. It's water, it's a few million times slower. But the basic ingredients are excitability, and self-feedback. Okay? You have good agreement between theory and experiment. This is, of course, quite specific for the laser systems, because we know that these laser equations are very good and describe the devices quite well. Okay? And the data storage is possible, but you have to take into account the fact that this is drift to equidistance. And if you have a very long device, you know, if, you have, if you have the delay is much, much, much longer, then the drift is much, much, much slower. So it looks like you can write bits wherever you like. And they are sustained for a very long time, but still in the limit, the prediction is that they basically become equidistant. Okay? Now, ongoing work, we would really like to see you know, this, this experimentally verified. And the next step is to take the side of repulsing <coughs> elements and couple them together in networks. Okay? So to have two lasers that talk to each other, you know, on-chip integration, uh, simple uh, optical data manipulation, you know, if you have a bit and another thing has bits, people uh, use integrators, okay? You have two lasers coming at the same time as the third laser. Each input is too small, but if they're close enough together, the two together can trigger the third one. It's sort of like what happens in your brain, okay? Several neurons have to fire before a certain neuron fires, and the firing has to be close to each other, otherwise nothing happens. So you can imagine, you can go in the direction of coupling this into sort of logical elements and optical computing and brain-inspired or neuron-inspired uh, information process. That's where our experimental colleagues would like to go do. But whatever you do, you are always dealing with delay equations. So apart from what you have in mind, lots of other stuff can actually happen. With that, thank you very much for your attention. For any questions? <laughs> just in the same way that gives you a discrete system with, with delays uh, in there and you know so that thing reapplies. Uh, difference equations are also quite different. <laughs> difference equations.
but it's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are taking advantage of the fact that we have it's continuous time here, right? uh, which is the right description for these models. And in the analogous system you mentioned about neuro systems, what will be the, the self-feedback? Okay, so we have, um, okay, so we were looking at, with yeah. color line, we are starting off a project. So think of taking Hodgkin Hotsk Huxley and putting a mirror there so that after the axon goes somewhere, it comes back to itself. So there's very few cells that have a long axon and, and couple back to themselves. But maybe there are some. But what you should have in mind, you take two cells, okay? You have two cells that are coupled to each other. And if they're identical cells and they are coupled by, by axons, then it's basically equivalent, at least in the symmetry subspace, to having the self-feedback with the mirror in the middle. Okay? So if we talk to each other, we do exactly the same. You know, I send out a signal and you trigger and you comes back to me. To me it just looks like there was a mirror in the halfway. So, oh sorry, mirror way. Oh, right. So in addition to the fact you can get these periodic uh, yeah. pulses, I, and I guess uh, my guess from what you're saying is one advantage of having such a self-feedback instead of an external periodic excitation is the stability. Yes. It's, it is one mechanism yeah. in which you can make, uh, you know, fake losses. I mean, in the brain this happens not not so much with the exact same type of, I mean, a lot of these circuits are uh, excitatory and inhibitory, you know, which is uh, a refinement of what I talked about here that doesn't really exist in the laser circuit. But there's a lot of idea to use, you know, to try to mimic these kinds of things that can happen between cells and brain with laser devices, because it's much faster and much quicker and much cheaper to do these kinds of requirements and proofs of concept. Plus, people are interested in using this for optical computation. Yeah. People have tried this for a long time, so it hasn't been took off. Yeah. Yeah. Speed, yeah. yeah, it's a factor of a thousand faster than, than electronics. Speed is everything. So you showed us two, two pieces of bad news. <laughs> your, uh, <laughs> we're talking about using it as a storage device. Yeah. Right? And you, you were talking about writing different bits. The fact that the, uh, uh, you can have <coughs> equidistant pulses to have a stable solution really does not allow me to treat it as bits. The, number, the amount of information I have stored there is just the number of pulses rather than their location within the field. No. No, yeah, that's correct. That's actually a problem, yes. Right. It's very bad. So you, does, does you don't get exponentially many bits in there. You have three states. That's correct. Right. Then the second piece of bad news is that you cannot upswitch. Uh, beyond a certain point. Beyond a certain point. So uh, is there a possibility of upswitching if you somehow modify the system that you can make them temporarily non-equidistant? pushing two apart so that you can you can one more. okay look what you can do is if you want to have switch you wipe everything out and you trigger exactly what you want ah. okay I mean that's always possible that's it. but of course you know that's quite invasive and the, the timing is an issue I mean I should say if you really want to have long-term storage you can make that you can make the delay line very long 10 meters and then the pulse you can put lots of pulses in there the drift will be so slow that sort of the noise will be stronger than the drift okay? And you can virtually write stuff wherever you like, and it's going to be sustained over seconds, which is very long for reasons. And that has been demonstrated experimentally. Now, we're interested in this of making the delay line quite short, because if you want to integrate stuff on a chip, you don't want to have 10 meters of fiber cable uh, hanging out at the end. Okay? That would be rather like a mouse with a very, very long tail. So, yes, there is uh, bad news for this particular setup. If you want to make it very small, there are these limitations. Okay? But if you don't want these limitations, you can also make very long delay loops, and then you can write almost wherever you like. Okay? If you leave enough space between pulses, like say two times the refractory period, I'm sure this is going to be stable for a very long time so that you could actually use it this way. And then you have you know, more data. The disadvantage is you have to also wait longer, right? Because the distance between the pulses is the time you have to wait before you're going to read the next bit. So, you know, I mean, it's sort of. Conservation of difficulty in this okay. game, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no silver bullet that's how to work. But at least, you know, now you know what really the issues are and uh, what the mathematics behind it. Okay. Yes. So, <coughs> the delay is a parameter, a fixed parameter. Yep. Is it physically possible in, <coughs> in this situation to vary the delay in time? Um, so for us, the delay can be varied like any other parameter. And in fact, if you let it go to zero, it's a regular perturbation of the OD, okay? So for us, as mathematicians, we can change the delay in any way we like. 
So for physically example, in the lab, it's, it's a bit harder because you know if you have a mirror somewhere, you know you cannot uh, on the time scale of the lasers move the mirror. Around, okay, so that that's a problem. For example, the delay e. might be uh, sine of t. Sine of t plus sine of t. Yes, that's, I mean it, you can. Okay, it there. varies with a certain frequency. Uh, that's possible. Uh, you can vary it with uh, piezos, you can vary it by uh, heating, I mean there's all kinds of things because the, the actual delay of the fiber has to do with the refractive index and all kinds of things. Okay, so that you can make very fast oscillations of the delay. There's a whole literature on periodically varying delays, there's literature on noisy delays. That's not where I'm going here. Okay, so here the delay, the basically you choose the delay once and it's not a parameter that you can easily change in the experiment, at least not on the, on the on the, uh, of the order of magnitude that would make a difference for the bifurcation. Yeah, the delay could be a function of the state of the system. Yes, that's a very excellent question. I've actually been recently working with uh, state-dependent delay equations. They actually pop up more in biology, environmental modeling, and so forth. For lasers, the assumption that the delay is always the same is amazingly good, which is almost not true for anything else. Right? Because if you think of a neuron and you know how warm it is or what you thought about, that makes a difference. You know, El Nino, uh, you know, how warm it is on, on the planet depends how long the delay lines are. So lasers are very exceptional from this perspective, that the assumption of a fixed delay is extremely good. And that's been borne out by lots of experiments, not just the ones that I'm showing here. But if you model anything else, okay, a state-dependent delay is certainly the way to go. I'm very happy to talk. One, one more question and then... Yes, where was the question? Okay. Is the uh, time scale associated with the physics of the charging, that is to say, moving the, the state from the unexcited state to a point where it's going to kind of go in this sort of. Okay, track. so yeah, so there's uh, a number of time scales here. Let me go back to this one. To, uh, yeah. Okay, so one time scale is you have to move over here. If you want to do this sort of instantaneously, you just hit the thing with the laser pulse and it basically jumps in. I mean, of course, you know, there's a continuous change. It's not really just, just a point that you hop, but this is a pretty good approximation. Okay. The other time scale is how long it takes you to get back and to make the pulse. It determines the width of the pulse. It has to do with internal processes in the laser. And then the other one is how quickly your reservoir reloads, which has to do with the absorber. And that's the time it takes you after the pulse, and the intensity is almost zero, Go back to here, so you can trigger that. So there are three times involved. Right. And this is this is fast. This is sort of intermediate, and this is very slow. Right. If you're into slow, fast systems, yeah. of course, on the time scale of the laser, everything is, just, um, everything is fast relative to each other. Rel okay, so relative to the internal time scales of the laser, of which we think uh, uh, the, the size of the laser is divided by the speed. Ah, thank you.